Our scripture lesson for this morning comes from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 26, beginning with verse 14. Turn with me as we read from God's Word. Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests, and he asked, What are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 silver coins. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? And he replied, Go into the city to a certain man and tell him, The teacher says, My appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him one after the other, Surely not I, Lord. And Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray, who would betray him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. And Jesus says, Yes, it is you. So is the reading of God's holy word. Let us pray. Gracious God, we ask that you bring to us a better understanding of this word of yours. Bring it to our hearts that we might grow and learn and become better disciples of yours. In the name of our Savior, we pray. Amen. I simply have to mention his name, and almost everyone knows Judas. You're a Judas, and we know what that means. He acted like Judas. He betrays. He's the betrayer. And everyone hates a betrayer. Every country has an infamous traitor in its history. In America, the first name that comes to mind for me is Benedict Arnold. Mention his name. He was the betrayer. Betrayal is at the heart of life. We have all been betrayed, every one of us. We have all come face to face with with Judas. And it hurts. It hurts because our betrayer is often a friend. How can she do this to me? I thought she was my friend. This is what makes Judas' actions even more treacherous. He sold Jesus out, his friend. After he agreed to sell him out, he even came to share with Jesus a common meal. He had the gall to show up. Judas came to eat with with him like a friend, like as if he still is his friend. But maybe that was his plan, to throw everyone off guard. Now, most scholars give Judas a break. They believe that he did not intend for for Jesus to die, that he was just trying to push Jesus to mount his revolt and to get rid of the Romans. Jesus wasn't moving fast enough, and so maybe if I hand him over, he'll get things started. You see, Judas refused to take Jesus as he was and tried to make him as he wanted him to be. One scholar wrote this in regards to that theme. It is not Jesus who can be changed by us, but we who are to be changed by Jesus. But... We try to change him all the time. 
to fit our schedule, to fit our life, to fit the desires that we have, to fit our passions, we try to change Jesus. We betray him in order to change him into what we want him to be. He is not doing what we want him to do. So we take the bull by the horn. He isn't moving fast enough on what we think we need. And so we jump in head first. He doesn't understand. You see, Jesus, you just don't understand what I really need. So we take charge of the situation. And in each one of these situations, we have betrayed him. And in each situation, things go wrong. The bull gores us. Jumping head first causes a head injury. And taking charge without Jesus' help causes a great amount of chaos and stress in our life. We betrayed him. Jesus, at the dinner, at the Sabbath, tells them, one of you is going to betray me. And they were all very hurt. Notice, though, the disciples did not start pointing fingers at each other. Oh, it, mu- it must be you. It's got to be. It's got to be Matthew. He's a tax collector. Oh, I know. It's Thomas. He looks a little guilty tonight. They didn't do that. They examined themselves. There's a nobility in that. They examined themselves. Is it I, Lord? Is it I? Every one of the disciples asked Jesus that question. Now, it's an interesting note. In the Greek, there is a particle that is often in questions like this. And when that particle shows up, it basically is saying that the questioner is expecting a negative answer. So when they say, is it I, they're expecting Jesus to say, no, 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 it's not you. So the disciples were were expecting this negative answer. And Judas asked his question in the same way, expecting a negative answer. He was expecting Jesus to say, no, it's not you, Judas. But what was Jesus' answer? You have said so. Yes, it is you. Jesus was making him face his decision to face his actions. He wasn't going to let him off the hook. A few years ago, there was a movie entitled Philomena. Maybe some of you saw it. It's the true story of Philomena Lee. See, in 1951, a teenage Philomena living in Ireland became pregnant outside of marriage. And she was sent to St. Rose Abbey in Rose Creek, Ireland, which is where all the unwed mothers went. And she bore a son. While she was working in the Abbey's laundry to pay off her cost of her stay there, the nuns underneath her nose had an American family adopt her son. And he was shipped off. She never got to say goodbye. She never even had a chance to say no. He was gone. And for 50 years, 50 years, Philomena attempted to find her son without success. She visited the Abbey on several occasions only to be told there's no more information available. And then finally, a man by the name of Martin Sixsmith, he was a British journalist, offered to help her in her search. And Philomena, with his help, discovered her son had become a prominent lawyer, serving as legal counsel to both President Reagan and President Bush. She also discovered he had traveled back to Sean Ross Abbey in Ireland with hopes of being directed to his birth mother. He was looking for her. But unfortunately, he died of AIDS in 1996. She also learned that her son's ashes are buried in the graveyard of the Abbey. When Martin, her journalist friend realized what the nuns had done, he exploded with anger. He could not imagine these nuns doing this. But to Martin's surprise, Philomena announces that it is her choice how she wants to respond to the way she was misled and mistreated. 
and turning to the one remaining nun, now in her 80s, who recalls her baby's adoption, she said, Sister Hildegard, I want you to know that I forgive you. I forgive you. Now Martin is incest. He can't believe his ears. What? Just like that? You forgive her? No, not just like that, Philemon encounters. That's hard. That's hard for me to do that. But I don't want to hate people. I don't want to be like you. I'm angry, Martin says. It must be exhausting, Philomena. She then asked the younger nun in the room if she would be so kind as to escort her to her son's grave. And before he follows Philomena out the door, Martin turns to the elderly sister and says, Well, I wouldn't have forgiven you. Betrayal can weigh upon us for years. But forgiveness can release us. Philomena knew this. Martin did not. Betrayal can destroy the person who betrays and the person who was betrayed. It is all a matter of forgiving yourself for your betrayal and your forgiving the person who has betrayed you. Jesus, I believe, ultimately forgave Judas. Now, he did hold him accountable for his actions, but I think he did forgive him. Judas could not forgive himself, and he took his life. Betrayal is such a deadly sin. It tears away your trust in others. It can cause you to wall yourself up. It can cause you to close yourself off and not let anyone in ever again. You can keep yourself so protected that you cannot find love and happiness. But friends, healing comes when you try again to open your heart to another and to forgive. That's where the healing begins. Let us pray. Gracious God, it's tough. It's tough to forgive someone who's betrayed us, especially if it's a dear friend. And we need to ask for your strength and your courage to forgive. To forgive and to be free to be free to, to live again and to enjoy life and to open our hearts to others. In the name of our Savior, we pray. Amen.